This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. It is our last show of 2017, and on behalf of everyone at the Mises Institute, we would like to wish you and your families a very happy and healthy and prosperous new year. So our final show features our good friend, Dr. Bob Murphy, giving a talk at an event we hosted in Orlando just a few weeks ago, giving his particular take on the culture wars, which is a topic I'm sure very close to all of us. And I think if you're a fan of Bob Murphy, you'll enjoy it very much. And of course, we look forward to some great new shows and some great new guests on Mises Weekends in 2018. What I wanted to do for this uh, forum is to, to not do my conventional talk. So I'm going to touch on some things that I, I always hit in these types of events, but also try to go beyond that. And as this was billed to you guys and what you thought you were getting is we're going to be like looking at the trends and sort of looking at the future. So that's always a dangerous thing to do. So I want to at least just, you know, set the benchmark here of what I'm trying to beat. So some of you already know this, but back in 1998, uh, Paul Krugman w was asked to write something on trends of the future and make predictions. And so this is what Krugman wrote in 1998. By 2005 or so, it will become clear that the Internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. Okay, so... <laughs> I can't say that what I'm going to say to you guys is going to be correct, but it will be not that horribly wrong, all right? So that's what I'm going to do. I was pretty sure that joke would work with you guys. All right. Not a lot of Krugman fans in the crowd. Okay. Let me also say that what I have to talk about is um, very, uh, I'm very pessimistic, especially in the, in the medium turn. And so I, I just do want to mention, you know, that I, I have a religious faith and that, that's why I'm, I'm upbeat in the, in the long run. But uh, knowing that you know, suffering produces wisdom, and in that respect, I think we're going to get a lot wiser over the next 10 years. So that's one way of summarizing where I'm coming from. So let me just mention, and, and by the way, it's, it's almost eerie how much Jeff and my, my remarks here are dovetail with each other. We didn't plan it like that. It's just we're seeing things mostly the same way. But my conclusion is going to be a bit perhaps more extreme than what, what his was. So we will give you some variety there. So let me just... It, I endorse everything he was talking about, his diagnosis of the trends, but what I want to add on top of that is I think there's a really bad economic crash coming. All right, So I think Jeff might believe that also, but he didn't stress that. So what I want to say is all of these things we're seeing, you know, how much Americans are at each other's throats, and, and for, if, especially if you're not online a lot, I mean, my hat's off to you that you probably are, are wiser for that decision and you have more sanity, but I have been just really surprised. I'm going to come back and give you some more specifics in a minute, but... I was surprised at just the, the vitriol and how much people hate each other now. And this is when, you know, there's still food on the shelves, right? Or, and we're not being literally bombed by another country. So, I mean, you can imagine how bad would things get if, you know, the economy crashes or if the dollar crashes and then all of a sudden, you know, the money coming from Washington gets cut off and people can't get jobs and, you know, there are supply inter interruptions and so on, or there's another major terrorist attack on U.S. soil Imagine the climate right now and how much people distrust each other and beyond that, don't trust their motives. Like they think those people over there, you know, my fellow Americans, are just evil. Like there's half the, well, let's say 30% of the country thinks another 30% is just moral monsters and vice versa. And so I'm saying, and that's what we're seeing even now when the economy is just, you know, kind of blicky. But imagine if there's a huge crash like Great Depression era stuff with these cultural forces in play. And that's the kind of thing I'm very concerned about. So when, just keep that in mind when I come to why I am more aggressive in the sorts of you know, solution or what, what can we do to make the best of a bad situation. It's because I'm worried about that sort of outcome. So just to give you a, a picture of this, and by the way, I, if you come and talk to me afterwards, I can send you links to you know, more formal presentations to, to back up some of this stuff. But just the big picture, if you would all buy the Austrian story about what happened with the housing boom and bust, it, you know, it has to do with the Federal Reserve, it had an easy money policy, you know, there was the dot-com bubble in the late 90s and then the crash and then the September 11th attacks. So the economy on paper should have had a bad recession in the early 2000s, and it did officially have a recession, but Greenspan was the Fed chair at the time and brought down interest rates and and people were calling him the maestro because, wow, at least housing kept rising even as the economy you know, went into a formal recession. 
And then in retrospect, people, of course, were saying, you know what, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. Maybe he shouldn't have replaced the, the NASDAQ bubble with a housing bubble that just postponed the pain and set us up for an even worse crash 2007, 2008. So, you know, how do the Austrians fit their narrative into that, that timeline? Is they'll say, okay, yeah, the Fed had uh, an easy money policy. This is standard Austrian business cycle theory, just adapted to the particulars of the situation, that there's a crash, the Fed slashes interest rates, pumps in extra money, that gives the appearance, the illusion of prosperity, but it really is just built on quicksand because you're not making us richer, you're not fixing the structural problems just by creating money out of thin air and injecting it into financial markets, all right? But then if you look at the, the numbers and what happened, to me, you know, if, if that story sounds plausible to you, well, like for example, interest rates, so the federal funds rate, that when they say the Fed cut interest rates today, that particular metric, it was at 6.5% uh, in 2000, and then it was brought down to 1% by the middle of 2003. Okay, so that was the lowest interest rates got in that easing cycle. And then they started ratcheting it up gradually. Every time the Fed met, they'd raise it by 25 basis points, 50 basis points over the next several years. You know, so, and they, they kept it at 1% for one full year. And then in the middle of 2004, that's when they started tightening. All right, so if that's the idea, if, if you buy the Austrian story, then you have to think the housing bubble, to the extent that it was either exacerbated by or caused by easy money, it's the fact that the Fed took interest rates down to 1% and held them there for a year. That's you know what you got to think did it, or that was the, a big contributor. And, and like I said, the timeline works with that. If you look at graphs of the you know, housing price appreciation against Fed policy, so the story fits. I'm just telling you that in terms of the magnitudes, if you believe the, Aust the basics of the Austrian story, that's what you gotta, you're got you committed to, is the thing bringing down interest rates to 1% and hold them for a year gave us the housing bubble, or at least you know exacerbated it. Okay, so then what happened after the crisis hit in the fall of 2008, they brought interest rates down to zero and held them there for seven years, and then start, started you know slowly raising them, and we're still ve very low, we're just barely above where we were you know, when, when Greenspan brought them down to 1% right now. Okay, so to the extent that you just are picking interest rates as a measure of Fed's you know, easy versus tight money policy, what they did is, it's not even close, and then as many of you already know, if you look at, even what I just said is misleading because it's, it's overly optimistic, because once you get interest rates down to 0%, it's hard to push them below that. Right, because um, you know, you get the idea. Because you lend someone a hundred dollars and they give you a hundred dollars back next year, it's hard to make it go lower. It's hard to, you know, say I'll lend lend a hundred and just pay you back ninety eight next year, right? Okay, so because you could just store it under your mattress. Incidentally, though, I mean, economists used to use logic like that to prove negative nominal interest rates are impossible until we had negative nominal interest rates in Europe. At which point economists said, ah, we can explain that, you know, just for a small speaking fee, I'll explain it all to you, right? So <laughs> economists are very good at after the fact explaining what just happened. So, but, but the, so my point is the fact that interest rates got brought down to that federal funds rate got brought down to 0% was there for seven years, that makes it look like, oh, that was a little bit easier and then seven times as long. No, if you look at other measures like the Fed's balance sheet, I mean, it's, it's not even close, okay? In the Fed's balance sheet more than doubled in like the first seven months right after the fall of 2008, okay, when the, when the crisis hit, all right? So if you wanna think of it this way, Ben Bernanke inflated the money supply more than all Fed presidents combined in like seven months, all right? So he was an overachiever, all right? So I'm just trying to get you to see that. And we can talk, and I know some of you have asked me and in the q and I'm happy to, talk about, well, gee, you know, why didn't, how come bread's not $30 a loaf and, and that kind of stuff, but, and we can, and I'm happy to get into that, but my point is just to the extent that you at all buy the basic idea that if the economy's bad, you don't fix it by creating a bunch of money, and certainly not by the Fed creating trillions of dollars and then buying mortgage-backed securities and debt issued by the federal government, that that's probably not the way to fix the economy. Well, that's what they did, and that's what made the stock market start booming. And you know, and think of all the things that the Obama administration did. You know, bringing in Affordable Care Act, um, extensive regulations on coal-fired power plants, running 
there were four years in a row where the, the budget deficit was higher than a trillion dollars. Okay, most recently there was 666 billion. Okay, so the amount, just the, the mushrooming of the federal debt, all these things that even in normal times, any two or three of them, you would, as a free market friendly person, you would have been like, wow, that's not good. And all that happened all at the same time after this collapse of the housing bubble that everyone admits, if we had just stepped back and done nothing, major investment banks would have gone down if they hadn't been bailed out. Okay, so what I'm saying is that this feeling like this right now, and okay, I think there's some people like, okay, yeah, that was bad, the Great Recession was bad, and we're kind of slowly limping and coming out of that. I don't think that's correct. I think they pushed off the real crash, and it's going to be that much worse, and now that they're tightening, at some point it's going to hit. Um, let me give you, a, and so as interest rates rise, just to give some indications is, okay, but what specifically, you know, you're just this vague, you know, wow, this can't be good. But specifically, what are some of the, the you know, shoes that are going to drop here? So last fiscal year, the interest on the federal debt held by the public, so the amount of money in terms of the Treasury's expenditures, you know, they spend money on the, the military, Social Security, da, da, da. How much was just interest payments on outstanding federal debt held by the public? And, and that's, keep that in mind. I'm, I'm talking here about the debt that's you know, just held by outsiders, because there's a lot of the debt that's theoretically held by the Social Security Trust Fund, right? So this is money that's literally, you know, the government has to tax people to then send checks to outsiders who are sitting on treasuries. That was $276 billion last year, okay? That, I mean, much bigger than most countries' entire output was just the interest in one year to service the existing debt. And that was with a, a yield of 2.3%. Okay, so that's partly what the explanation is. How could the debt have gotten so big since, um, you know, it, the last year of the George W. Bush administration, there was a big deficit. And then, like I say, under Obama, there were several years where it was enormous. And even now, it's still big. And, of course, the uh, Republican plans for the tax changes are going to presumably make the deficit still high going forward. Partly the reason that pain hasn't manifested itself is because that was at the same time when interest rates collapsed. Okay, so it's sort of like you can run up credit card debt as long as you keep getting 0% APR balance transfers in the mail, but then when those offers to roll it over stop, that's when, you know, you're really in trouble. So just imagine in, in 2006, just to give you a frame of reference, the average yield on outstanding government debt was like 5%, so double what it is right now. So even if interest rates just rose a few points, not, you know, some crazy scenario where we're Greece, but just going back to what interest rates were a decade ago, then that would more than double the service costs, so you know, more than $250 billion per year extra at interest payments. Okay, so just think about that. I mean, people are freaking out, as Jeff said, calling the Republican tax plan Armageddon. That's expected to do what? At least the, the static analysis, 1.5 trillion over 10 years. So that's 150 billion extra a year, and everyone's losing their mind, saying this is the worst idea ever. If interest rates just go up two points, that's an extra $250 billion a year in debt service costs. Okay, so I'm just trying to get you to see how big these numbers are. And again, I'm not talking about what if the dollar crashes or what if the treasury, I'm just talking slight increase of two percentage points. Um, the other thing is people are, are, are praising Janet Yellen as the best Fed chair ever. And the reason they're saying this is because they're saying, look at the Fed's mandate, what's their dual mandate? It's to keep price inflation down and high unemployment and you know, to have stability. And the, uh, the unemployment rate officially is, is very low and you know, we, we don't see CPI blowing up, so she's doing a great job. By the way, I think she's smart. If she can get out before the crash happens, she, she will be able to say, look, it wasn't my fault. You, know? <laughs> you men don't know how to run a central bank. You know, I, I, that's, that's how I would play it if I were her. But um, the, the la there's certain things with the labor market. And again, these are all official numbers. It's not that I have to go to shadow stats or something. These are all, you can look this stuff up, St. Louis Federal Reserve. These, the part of the reason, and I know many of you know this, but I just want to say it uh, for comprehensive sake, partly why the official unemployment rate number is so low is because the way that number is, is counted, if you're not actively seeking work, you're not unemployed, right? Because, it, and there's a logic that I know some people when they hear that they think that's nutty, but because, you know, if you're an 80-year-old retired person and you're not trying to get a job, it would be weird to say you're unemployed, right? So you're just, you're not in the labor force. But what can happen is 
if people become discouraged or just they know the job market prospects are so bleak they don't even try to get a job, then you fall out of the labor force and so you're not part of the unemployed and so you're not in the numerator when they say the unemployment rate is such and such percent. So I think a better metric to account for that is to look at what percentage of the civilian labor force is actually employed. Okay, so that's not asking whether or not you're trying to work, that's not getting inside your head, that's just objectively looking and say how many people are there, you know, non-military and of work, you know, six, I think it's 16 and above, or they're 16 to 65, something like that maybe, and then say what percentage of them are employed. And so that figure right now is the lowest it has been since the 1970s. And if you look at the chart over time, I mean, it's, it goes like this and comes down. And the reason it was rising in the 70s and you know, through the 80s and 90s, I think it peaked in the late 90s, is because more and more women were formally entering the workforce. Okay, and so the way they run these numbers, like you know, a woman who would have been a housewife in 1950, who has an office job in 1980, now counts as working. You know, not that obviously people, not that women weren't working in the 50s, but you get the point that wasn't shown up in the statistics. So that's partly why that ratio came way up. And now it's as low as it has been in the 1970s. So that's one measure. To give you a more specific one, if you look at just among teenagers, so 16 to 19 year olds, in the year 2000 of that demographic, 16 to 19 year olds, 52% of them were employed. Right now, 34% of them are employed. Okay? And so, that's, I mean, that's a huge drop just in 17 years. And, and again, if you look at the chart of that thing, it's, it plummets during the, the recession, you know, under George W. Bush. It started to come back a little bit, and then going into 2008, it fell off a cliff again, and it's just barely started coming back up. Okay, so this idea that the labor market was bad for a few years after 2008, but then things bottomed out, and now we got a tight labor market, and the Fed's worried about price inflation, and because you know everyone's got a job. That is, is masking this huge, you know, millions of people who normally would have had a job at a young age that now aren't in the workforce. So that's just another thing that in my mind is a, a, a seed that hasn't been planted, if you will, that um, is, is going to just show up over time. So it's not that the direct problem from that is going to appear next Tuesday, but the fact that there's millions of young people who normally would have had work experience, just you know, standard things like knowing how to show up for a job and, and not talk back and you know, just do a simple task and everything. And those, it, it matters if you, don't, if you miss out on that. Okay, so I think some people are, they don't fully appreciate just how much acculturation there is and just easing people into having a regular job from having you know, a, a part-time job at McDonald's or something, there's something to be said for that. And so there's now a whole demographic that's missing that. And I think you're gonna see that over time as, as those people are gonna have difficulty getting a job at all. And so as they get older, that's gonna be a, a problem, not just in terms of the economy, but just, just socially, if there's millions of people who really just can't find work. Um, so then switching to that, and, and part of the reason if you adjust those figures for who's in school, that, that explains part of it. But even if you just look at like teenagers who aren't in school, the number of employed back in 2000 to right now, there's still like a 10 percentage point drop. Okay, so it's not simply that they all went to school. And then, but even within that, I, my interpretation is not to say, ah, things are good instead of now students who are, or, or sorry, young people who are going and becoming auto mechanics, now they're all becoming Renaissance men and women because they're going to undergrad, you know, in our fine universities. I, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's more that they can't get a job and then they're going and, and racking up huge amounts of debt and not learning many valuable skills at colleges. And so there, that's another one of these trends that I'm seeing. It, there's a lot of cliches and I know, you know, people talk, oh, there's safe spaces on colleges and the snowflakes and whatever. And, you know, if you look like the Tom Woods show, he complains about it all the time. Tom's here. Um, and, and so, and that's all true. But what I want to stress, if you haven't seen that, I, I think you might think we're exaggerating. Okay. Or they all oh, come on. Yeah. Young kids are always smart, Alex. You really don't know. You have no idea how bad it is. Okay. There, there's something different. This is not a matter of, oh, gee, there's a bunch of people who have different views about what, what uh, health insurance should be provided by the government. Or, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying people who their reaction to, oh, there's a speaker coming to campus that we don't like that person's views. 
we are going to credibly threaten that we will break stuff and hurt people. We will set things on fire and smash windows. And so then the, the school has to cancel because of security concerns. And then that gets spun as, oh yeah, the reason that speaker couldn't come here is because he would incite violence. I mean, just the kind of mindset that would, would do that and that would, and that would see no, nothing weird about that, that yeah, the reason the speaker can't come here is because he promotes violence by us, his enemies. I mean, that, that's a weird thing. That's not a matter of disagreement, all right? And so I'm saying that type of thing, just shutting down debate is becoming more widespread. Um, you know, the term could be used as, as cultural Marxism. I've seen some people complain about that and say that's not really accurate, but whatever label you want to put on that, but that mindset, and I saw it myself even when I was at NYU, I went, my buddy who just has this perverse sense of adventure, there was like a feminist group talking about the history of the Soviet Union. He's like, Bob, we're going to this meeting. And so we were the only, I think we were the only two guys in there and I was really uncomfortable and they were, you know, going through. And so at the end, and I tried to very timidly, I said, hi, hi, we're new here. This is our first meeting. And, um, but you know, your talk, you were mentioning how you were so proud of the fact that the women and the men were, you know, were equal in the Soviet Union, you know, during this famine period. But I mean, the, the women in the United States had food. So like, does that, does that matter? You know, and I, I said, it's something like that. <laughs> And I know, like, right now I'm coming off as being sarcastic. I, I really was trying to just, like, I was curious, like, to, and you should, the, the woman's face, she was like, like that. Like, I can't, it, it was like I had just told her that I was Napoleon. You know what I mean? Like, so she wouldn't try to convince me I wasn't. She wouldn't be like, show me some ID, you know, because then I would say, I'm the king. I don't need ID. What are you talking about? But you, you see, that was the, the reaction she had. I was like, oh, you're one of those. You know, like one of the people who care about how much food people eat. Ha <laughs> ha, okay. <laughs> and, it, it, but I, I mean, again, unless you've experienced it, it's really so, this is not something that's going to be settled by plebiscite and, oh, well, we're going to get, you know, mobilize our people. We get enough petitions signed. I mean, th there's, you can't settle this. Or they reject rational argument. Now, in their mind, they would think, you know, that, that we do the same thing. So I'm not saying that we're, we're better or something, but I'm just saying that communication with someone who has that me mentality is not really an issue. This isn't just something like, oh, I don't like that person's politics. It's, it's far more qualitative and comprehensive than that. And if you don't really know what I'm talking about, you know, trust me, it, it's, this is not simply a matter of, oh man, there's more Democrats on campus now than there used to be because they don't like Trump. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying this is a qualitative thing of, we need to silence opposition because these people are evil. People don't deserve to hear them. There can't, you can't have free speech when there's someone who espouses hatred. Right, or someone who's from the patriarchy should not be given a platform because that would stifle free speech. So that's why we're gonna burn cars if this person comes and tries to talk. Right, so that's the fullest expression of free speech is through burning cars. Okay, you think I'm making up something to try to get a laugh out of you, that's, that's not what I'm doing. All right, I mean, I'm serious. People, they were asked this, certain student activists, and they said things just like what I'm saying there. That they, they in their mind, they were defending free speech by making it impossible for a speaker to come and say stuff they disagreed with. Okay, um, other things in terms of the cultural milieu here, this whole punch a Nazi. I don't know if you've seen this. So there was, um, you know, Richard Spencer was given a thing on camera. Someone came up, he's like a, a white nationalist guy. Someone came up just out of nowhere, punched him, and that started circulating. People thought it was hilarious and punch a Nazi became a meme. And I had thought people were kidding. And I thought maybe they just meant hey, I'm not losing sleep over this guy because I hate his gut. And maybe that's what some of them meant, but it, it became clear to me that no, there were many people who they literally thought, yeah, th that, those views are so distasteful. Someone who's talking about white nationalism or things like that, fascism, it's okay to punch them because you know, that's just, that's completely unacceptable and you gotta shut those people up. What harm is there in doing that? And it, again, it just alarmed me. I would not have predicted people that I know would have said that. Um, one guy who, who said that, view, you know, he was more like, eh, I'm not losing sleep over it. It was his birthday. And so I wished him happy birthday on Facebook and, and said, hey, why don't you have for fun? Why don't you go punch a Marxist just to see, you know, and, and he didn't, didn't want to do that. But my point in flipping it was to show talking like that, you know, say, oh, we're going to punch a Marxist. That sounds crazy, right? You, you know, it's a joke. You know, I'm not serious because again, and it's not because, you know, Marxism hasn't really had a bad record in terms of history. Right, but just you know, I'd say I flipped it just to try to get you know to see look how crazy this is. But yet again, if you're not on Twitter and stuff, maybe you don't know you know you think I'm exaggerating. But 
I'm telling you, there are plenty of respectable people that you would normally have thought would say, oh yeah, violence is absolutely unacceptable as a means of reconciling political disputes. That No, they were saying, no, these people are so bad, I can't believe in our country someone's you know, waving the swastika, and so yeah, if somebody goes and punches that person, maybe that's a good thing. So that's, you know, again, so I'm saying if this, if people are okay with using violence to shut up their political opponents now, imagine if the economy crashes anywhere remotely as bad as, you know, I'm saying might happen. That, that's, that's what I'm trying to get, get across by this stuff is to say if people right now are putting on the table violence is okay or we're going to look the other way when Antifa, you know, smashes windows and whatever because, yeah, that, you know, that Ann Coulter, she says some horrible things, so... Yeah, maybe I wouldn't go and smash windows, but I could see why those kids would do that. If that's your mentality right now, imagine how bad it's going to be if the economy crashes. Also, dovetailing with what Jeff was saying, I think you know the next the next time a Democrat gets in the White House, there, I mean, rightly or wrongly, many there's millions of people who think there is an absolute monster right now in the White House who's dismantling everything they love about the country. And so just the, the, the payback, the revenge that there's going to be when the next Democrat gets in is, you know, I, I, I shudder to think about it. And again, I'm, I hope this doesn't come off like I'm defending Trump or anything. I'm certainly not. But my point is just why I am very fearful for the future in terms of, of these trends. Uh, another thing about the surveillance state. That's another list of, tr uh, you know, a, a trend here I've, I've seen. Two quick things, because I want to leave time for your guys' questions. The, uh, I used to be optimistic about it, and I said, okay, I know there's like facial recognition software, but if you know how those things work, they need to be trained, right? The computer needs to know, like be shown lots of photographs of people and, and to have it identified in order for like all the security cameras around the country to be, you know, if you wanted some computer algorithm to be able to track everybody, the computer needs to be trained. And so you might think, okay, I mean, the only, they don't have the manpower to do that, the NSA, how many people they got working you would need millions of Americans to just upload photos of their own friends and relatives and then tag their identities. <laughs> so we still have no time whatsoever because that's what Facebook is, right? Likewise, the kind of stuff, you know, 1984, that vision of you know, having the telescreen in everybody's home is monitoring and no one can say anything. You know, I used to think, well, there's no way, if the government just mandated that, Americans would realize, wait a minute, you can't just have listening devices put in our thing. I mean, people would need to voluntarily buy some product and put it in their house that could monitor everything they say and call it Alexa. And what, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. Okay, so there's, there's all that stuff. Um, so as far as, you know, the, so that, that's the, the pessimism. So now what's the solution? Well, obviously, you know, I always say education, but now I'm a, a little more uh, specific about it, that the innovations we've seen, Uber and Airbnb, these are great because, I think it was actually Jeff who said this in a different talk, in terms of getting people to see the, the ability of innovation and free enterprise and getting around government cartels, that's, you know, the, the textbook you know, lectures from Tom DiLorenzo or somebody, that would never have convinced millions of progressives. But when they take an Uber ride and know what a cab ride in New York City is like, and then see that the cab lobby is saying, oh no, Uber is unsafe, you know, you might get abducted by your driver, and so that's why it's gotta be illegal. They can see, no, that's just, they're protecting their turf, you know, it's so, and I know lots of people in Nashville, uh, art musicians and things who were renting out rooms through Airbnb, and then they tried to shut that down. I think it failed, but there was a measure from the hotel lobby to shut that down, of course, as being unsafe, and you know, the building could cave in, we can't have our, our visitors to our fine city, you know, having a building cave in on them when clearly it was because the hotels were losing business, right? So a lot of progressives who normally don't trust free enterprise, they can see the virtues of these things. Also, uh, Bitcoin and you know, alt, alt currencies in general, whether Bitcoin's a good idea or not, or is gonna do anything, that's not my point. Just people see the notion of a blockchain. They, they get, oh, wait a minute, somebody could just invent a new type of money that circumvents the system and people voluntarily can embrace it or not. So that, uh, I think are, are good examples just to show people this is how it can work in practice to see the conventional ways, the things that are produced by the government, you know, the, the heavily regulated industries, the, the money that's, you know, that the central banks produce. If somebody comes up with a better idea with technology now, it's a lot easier just to start producing that and to see the virtues of it. You don't like Bitcoin. If you think it's a bubble, okay, don't use it. And I think people get, oh, whereas 
it's a little bit harder to say, oh, if you think the, the, you didn't like QE, well, just don't use the dollar. You know? And you see how that, that those two don't ring the same, and so people can see the virtues of segregating things. Again, not because, oh, our way is better, but because we don't know who's right. And so you see the virtue of, uh, of sort of you know, insulating things and not having all our eggs in one basket and just the, the bur virtues of diversification. So I think people can see that with these distributed networks. And so what all that is leading up to is I, I feel much more strongly about what's going to happen in the next 10, 20 years. To me, the only realistic thing that might preserve liberty and be a good force mitigating a lot of these trends is a more serious secession movement. And just to take something specifically, like Texas breaking apart. Now that doesn't, you know, that's not going to happen in the next year or two. But if things got really bad, like I'm talking about, you know, and the federal government, you know, defaulted on its debt and the dollar crashed and so on, then you really might start seeing, and if there was like a terrorist attack and there's martial law being imposed, you could very well see that becoming a very serious thing. And so the reason I like, you know, the idea of Texas is just because geographically, that would just logistically would be easier for Texas to break away than some interior state. Another reason is I live in Texas, so you know, I'm, that's if we break away. <laughs> and my pledge is, if we do break away and then I don't have to pay federal income tax, if any of you want to hire me as a consultant, I will pass the savings on to you, all right? That's, <laughs> it's, it's, this isn't about me, all right? But I just happen to live in Texas. Also though, I'm, I'm, I'm new there, I've only been this, my, going to my fourth year there. The culture, in case you don't know, it's, it would be easier for them to become their own country than people who live elsewhere. So for example, um, People in Texas, I talk to them, if they're traveling in Europe and someone over there says, oh, where are you from? They don't say I'm American. They don't say I'm from the U.S. They say I'm from Texas, right? Whereas, you know, when I was a kid, if I I wouldn't say I'm from New York State. Like, that wouldn't even occur to me. I'd say I'm from the U.S. Um, they uh, apparently, I've heard from several sources there, when you're with the kids growing up in Texas, they, in their school, in their history classes, they learn more about Texas state history than they do about U.S. history. Again, I think most of us, if, you have, if you're not from Texas, you don't know anything about your state history, but that's how they're taught there. There is a tradition of them being their own country. Uh, Phil Magnus one time came out to Texas Tech. Uh, we hosted him for, he was part of this conference we did, and he was given a little of the history of Texas, and so he starts the talk and said, and I guess he's from Texas too, he said, hey, I'm pretty, how many people, how many native Texans do I have? You don't have to class raise it. He goes, all right, let's give a hand for the best country on earth. And they're all, yeah, right? So, I mean, I'm just saying they, they have that mentality already. So I think that there's um, that element. And what, so what it would do, just to, so you can see, it's not just, oh, so therefore the, the people in Texas would be all right. And it's not even just, oh, and there would be a, a refuge for people in the other 49 states who wanted to move to Texas if that were a possibility. But then that would also temper the things that the you know, remain, remainder of the U.S. government could do. Okay, because it would know we can't have taxes be too outrageous because then everyone's just going to go to Texas. Okay, so it's sort of like one of the conventional explanations of how did political liberty as we know it, why did that emerge in Western Europe and not like in China or somewhere else? And one of the standard stories is, well, because of the geography and other specific factors, accidental factors, there were squabbles among nobles and so on in Western Europe. And it was easy for exit. It was easy for people just to leave one jurisdiction and go elsewhere. And so that sort of forced, you know, the, the, the noblemen and so on there, the, the kings, they couldn't be too tyrannical because they would just lose population. People would vote with their feet. Okay, so that sort of mentality is what I think would, would help temper it. Um, let me just end, though, by saying two things. So I, I think in terms of what can people do, it's just real simple stuff like, just get it on the table that, hey, uh, suppose the people in Texas, because we saw what happened in Catalonia, right? If you're not familiar with it, they were voting to, to break apart, and the government was sending in, you know, cops and stuff, breaking up voting booths and things. and saying this is illegal. You can't, you know, you don't have the authority to do this. I mean, so they were literally suppressing the vote. And so I think it's, it'd be useful to just start planting those seeds. Just, you know, you're at a, you're at a dinner party, and, you know, just talking to someone and say, hey, you know, um, Suppose somebody's in a relationship and they decide they want to leave. Is it acceptable to use violence to keep that person in the relationship? And everyone's going to say, of course not. What are you talking about, you monster? I go, oh, okay, good. I'm glad you should support the session. Thanks. <laughs> right? You just do it like that. The other thing is um, to, I, I think the word secession scares people because they naturally think slavery. Okay? 
And so maybe call it independence. So that's, you know, just in terms of, because it's, you know, the American Revolution, we talk about the Declaration of Independence, the War for Independence, America achieved its independence. That was a secessionist movement, but yet that's not the way Americans think about it. They think of it as, you know, what some people call the Civil War, what in Texas they call the War of Northern Aggression, right? That's what people associate secession with. So it's the same thing, but I think it's a lot easier, just if nothing else, to force people to say, no, if the people of Texas wanted to be independent, too bad. Right, at least make them say that. Whereas if you say, I'm not, I'm not against secession, that, that sounds like a technical legal question. Okay, so that's, um, so in me personally, what I'm gonna start doing is I think I, I will look at, you know, there's, there's budding secessionist movements in Texas, you know, people, organizations that have been around that got a big boost in popularity and attention when it looked like Hillary Clinton was gonna be the president, just like in California, when Trump won, all of a sudden the secessionist movement out there jumped in popularity. Um, and so like I might do things and look at because because there's a lot of practical difficulties like Jeff was alluding to like what about Social Security? What about their portion of the federal debt? So to at least have that stuff in place and ready to go in case for various reasons all of a sudden this becomes a political possibility um, Last thing I'll, I'll leave you with is I just looked at a, at a poll online that said um, if at least 70% of the people in Texas wanted to leave the union, what should the federal government do? And there were three choices. One was wish them well. The second was insist on a monetary payment before they leave, and the third was invade. And I'm glad to report 80% of the respondents chose A. Now, admittedly, these were my Twitter followers. I set up the poll, but still, <laughs> that's, it's, it's progress. And of the ones who said invade, some of them clarified, said, oh, I thought you said, what would the government do, not what should it do? So there was that, and then some were just trolls. So there's that, but in all seriousness, I do, I honestly think it, it might be good to, for people just to start planting those seeds, just to get people, because I think most people, you know, with the Declaration of Independence, it'd be weird for them to say, no, if a bunch of people really wanted to leave, we would bomb them into submission. I think they're gonna be hesitant to say it, but they might say it when it becomes a reality, and so to get them on record now, just to kind of, you know, have them think like that. Okay, so with those happy thoughts, thanks everybody. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.